All right, good afternoon. Let's get started. So today we're going to continue our discussion of security uh, in the context of mobile phones because the, we have great case studies of uh, how this works. And in particular, today we're going to talk about the security of actual applications uh, on these mobile devices. So just to remind you of the <coughs> context that where we left off uh, on Monday's discussion, uh, Monday's discussion was a lot about how to secure the device itself against theft, how to deal with potential compromises in the operating system, and so on. So there's going to be some operating system sitting on top of the device. And for this lecture, we're going to take it as a given that the operating system is secure, the device hasn't been stolen, the user you know, supplied their fingerprint, all this stuff. And we're going to instead talk about what it takes to provide security for applications. So if we're going to have multiple applications running here above the operating system, um, there's many security properties you might want even on that layer. Um, for example, there's probably a lot of data being stored on the device somewhere here. So maybe you have your contacts, or maybe you have your photos, and you need to answer the questions of, well, which apps should be able to read contacts and photos from your device storage. And there's probably various sensors, like you got a camera probably, and uh, you have a phone, location information, et cetera. Apps need to access these uh, sensors and peripherals on your phone as well. And then also we'll see situations where we need to worry about app-to-app -app interactions as well and protect uh, and provide some security story for when it's okay for different applications to interact with one another. Make sense? And the reason we sort of assigned the Android paper for this and the iOS paper for that is like not really so much any big judgment call on which one does what better, but just uh, I think the iOS paper explains their uh, lower level story slightly more detail, and the Android paper does a slightly, has more details about what happens at the app level in terms of isolation. Make sense? Questions about anything so far? Good, where are we going? All right. So before we dive into a discussion of how Android isolates applications from one another, it's uh, probably useful to think of what the alternatives are for how you run applications. So Android didn't come out of a vacuum. Uh, the, or like one prevalent model before Android came out was to use desktop applications. <clears throat> so what does the world look like for desktop apps in terms of answering these questions of which apps can access what data? Well, is there any isolation if you're running a desktop operating system? You have Windows or Linux. Do we have a picture like this? So what do, what do these operating systems provide to us? Any isolation at all? Yeah. Yeah, so the big deal in desktop operating system tends to be really files and content, so they worry about this. But the granularity of isolation is not really about individual apps. It's about sort of a model of you as a human being, you as a user. So really, it's users are principles. So all the permissions on these files are set in terms of which user can access them. And then apps are really not a thing that uh, is represented in the security model. Apps just run with full user privileges. So if you run an app, that app is running as you and has access to everything that you have access to. So if you're running some game on your laptop that happens to be running Linux or Windows or Mac OS, that game has all access to all your you know, files, all your uh, certificates, passwords, all the browser processes you might be running, all that stuff is directly accessible from every application you're running on your computer. There's no isolation between apps in a traditional desktop sense. So that sounds a little bit damaging if we want to uh, provide some degree of isolation between these apps and allow installing these things. Is there anything positive to be said for this plan, desktop plan, actually? Uh, I guess security-wise, uh, it does provide some isolation between multiple users. So if you had a multi-user computer system, I guess this would help. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe the main benefit, uh, really, is that uh, sharing is easy. So if you want to take a file and open it with one application on another, this just works. There's not even really much of a question there. 
And there's really sort of a split between the data that you have in the system versus the applications that you're using to access that data. So you can take the same piece of data, share it with different applications. Make sense? Sort of a thing we, of course, take for granted, I think, in desktop applications, in desktop sort of contexts, but uh, good to keep this in mind because we'll see that other worlds, including Android and some others, don't really have that mindset and uh, leads to some complications. All right. So another thing I want to contrast with is uh, instead of desktop apps, uh, so by the way, this is like, you know, before Android came out, people thought this was a reasonable model. I guess they still use it. And actually, before Android came out, there were like embedded Windows, Windows CE, which would run on phone-like devices and had this model on mobile phones. So it was not unthinkable, just, uh, you know, didn't have maybe as strong of a security property as you now take for granted as a requirement. Um, another model you could imagine is maybe web applications. So maybe Android guys should have just, well, one, one thing is they could have just said, well, everything you're gonna run on your mobile phone is gonna be in a web browser. We don't really need a new app model. Let's just make them all web apps in JavaScript. Not an unreasonable, maybe, proposition, because one cool thing in web apps is that you really have isolation for apps. So in, unlike the desktop world, where every app you run has the same permissions on all your data, in the web world, every app is isolated. So it's fine to visit some sketchy website with an app because it's not gonna be able to access your state for your bank website or uh, Gmail, et cetera. So why not this model? What's, what's going on in the web app world? We haven't talked about it extensively, but I'm sure you guys have used the web, so maybe you have some sense of why this might be hard. Why did Android guys invent a whole new app model if the web was already there? Yeah? Um, do you need a constant uh, connection to the internet? Yeah, so maybe there's some tangential constraint that you need like a server to be online and you maybe need to talk to the server. That's certainly I think, part of the story. But even when Android was coming out, there was already support in browsers for offline web apps like Chrome supports today. Um, so maybe you could mitigate this by saving all the HTML and JavaScript locally. Other things? Yeah. Web apps typically don't have file system access. That's true. So yeah, so no file system. Um, so why is this a problem or, yeah. I mean, you can store data in web apps the same. You can like store all, you know, like in Google Drive, you upload all your files. It's not a file system in the sense that it's not a classical kernel storing your files for you but uh, you can store files just like in a file system in Google Drive. Yeah? Is the basis flexible because sometimes you might want to share data between different apps and the web apps won't want to have Yeah, apps. so I think the, the, the sort of other part of, you know, this was one annoyance we talked about. The other, I think, maybe bigger issue is really no sharing. And I wanna be a little bit more careful here. So it's not like there you can't share on the web. The web is all about, you have links and applications sort of you know, being able to uh, send the user to a different website. But the kind of sharing that's really difficult in a web world is, uh, suppose I use some website to store my photos. And now I wanna edit that photo with Flickr or with Google Photos or whatever. Uh, there's not really a good plan for me to get my photos from one web app to another. And maybe, for popular apps, they sort of integrate one with each other, some kind of an N-squared mesh, like Google Photos now knows how to get my stuff to Flickr and back, but it's really these pairwise arrangements between applications that allow you to share some data in the web. There's not really a general purpose plan, like I can come out with my own photo editor and it'll just work with any existing photos that users have. I'll, just, I'll have to, it'll be on me as the developer of this app to like, go out and talk to all the popular sites. So I think this is the sort of annoyance uh, of web apps, or the one problem that the Android guys are really trying to solve here. Yeah? Would, if you have an operating system on Android, could I say create like an intent saying like export to Android, and then Android would say like import to Google Drive, import to whatever web app that you wanted? So you're saying like once you have Android, you could fix this problem. Yeah. That's true, yes, Android fixes this problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about how, the, the, the lecture is gonna be about how to do it, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Good. All right, other questions? All right, 
So indeed, we'll, we'll talk about how uh, sort of in the web, before Android came about and before uh, Android machinery was available, that was a big problem. And this is really what the sort of Android setup tries to solve. So in order to talk about Android applications in a little bit more detail, let me try to start sketching out what these applications actually look like so that we can have a detailed discussion of like what the pieces are and how they interact and how they achieve this sharing goal. So mechanically, Android apps kind of look like a Linux process, if you will, right? So there's a, what is an app? It's uh, to a first approximation, you have a binary. So some kind of a executable file, some code that the app comes with, probably some data in there as well, you know, images, static files, et cetera. And this binary is just gonna run as a process on Linux. So your phone is running, on Android at least, you got your Linux kernel, and this binary is gonna run as some kind of a process here. And that's what it means to run an app on Android. And each app is gonna have some files, so it's cool, we have a file system. Uh, there's a file system where in Android it's slash data, slash data, slash app name. That's where your um, applications get to store their files, directories, whatever, so each app gets its nice directory, they can go store, re read, write data in there. And then uh, in addition to this, um, there's gonna be another thing which we'll talk about uh, in this lecture, which is there's a manifest that is accompanying the binary and the rest of the app code that describes various security properties. So we'll talk more about what's inside this manifest in a bit. Um, but that's sort of roughly what's uh, going on in an Android application. And the whole thing is signed by some private key of the developer. They sign this whole thing and uh, basically the code, the manifest, and the signature from the developer constitute an Android application. So this is actually what's sitting inside of those APK files that you might have interacted with on Android. Make sense? So that's what it means to sort of run an application. But then sort of uh, for, for security purposes, uh, Android has a fairly strict isolation plan, which is that I've drawn to you the picture of what it means to run one application on Android, but in fact you can have, of course, multiple applications, and each one runs in a fairly isolated environment, if you will, so you might have another application running over here. It has its own data directory, its own process, and Android configures the system such that these applications cannot tamper with one another. So you can imagine this is things like you read about in the OKWS paper where they jump through various hoops to get the Linux kernel to isolate these things, uh, to isolate these applications. So they assign a different UID, user identifier, to each process. They set permissions on the directories of each application and so on. So that for the most part, these applications run in isolation. They cannot go access each other's files directly. So even though there are files in the file system, the Android plan is not really uh, geared towards having applications directly share the files they're storing in the file system. We'll do sharing through some other mechanism on top of this, but at the lowest level, the goal is really to isolate these applications uh, almost like containers, like what you guys are doing in lab two. Make sense? Questions about this so far? All right, so that's the isolation story. There's a lot of mechanisms, actually the paper goes to some reasonable length explaining how Android keeps these processes from one another. UIDs are the base plan. They have all kinds of sophisticated schemes using extensions in the Linux kernel like SE Linux to um, provide stronger guarantees that these applications are indeed isolated from one another. But then the, the hard part, as we were talking about, comes in from the fact that these applications do need to have some sharing. If we just had them isolated, it's good for security, but not as good for getting stuff done yet. So in order to do any kind of sharing in Android, we're gonna need to uh, send uh, these messages between applications that are called intents in Android terminology. So what the picture is gonna look like is if you have these two applications, like these guys on this board that wanna interact with one another, say like this guy wants to fetch some data from the files that the left application has stored in the file system, they're gonna have to send messages to one another, very much like in lab two, 
uh, you have to send RPCs from one uh, process or one container to another. So we'll have, of course, our kernel at the bottom, and there's gonna be one application sitting here. It wants to send a message to some other application sitting over here on the right. And we're gonna try to look inside the details of this guy uh, in a little bit to understand how these messages are constructed. In order to send messages, there's some minimal kernel support necessary to make this happen. And in Android's case, the kernel kind of knows about this notion of an, in a message called an intent and how it gets sent around. So the application sends an intent into the kernel. And the kernel needs to actually before, it doesn't just blindly give the intent to the target application. This would be bad for security because no checks were done whether it's actually okay to send this message to the application. Instead what happens is that there's a component that uh, Android calls the reference monitor that is basically another Linux process that sits around and the kernel knows this guy is special and gives the intent to the reference monitor. And then it's gonna be the reference monitor that figures out where this intent should go, should go anywhere for that matter, and uh, what else might happen, and then forwards this intent on to the recipient application. So this reference monitor is gonna be in charge of enforcing quite a bit of the security policy in terms of app-to-app -app sharing here because it's gonna be looking at all the intents sent between applications. Make sense? Yeah. The way that you're drawing it assumes that the reference monitor is gonna take back to the kernel that hosts your application. Yeah. Right, so actually, as, as, a, as a term, yeah, indeed. So th that is actually what happens. You, the, in the reference monitor, it reads out messages from the kernel and then looks at the message. It might actually modify the message in some way, like fill in some missing parts, uh, so on and so forth, and then re-inject it into the kernel and say, well, finally, it actually goes there. Yeah. And uh, this is a reasonably sophisticated scheme for the, well, for several reasons. One is that um, an app might send a message to a different app that's not even running yet. So one job of the reference monitor is to start this application process. So there's a difference between an app being installed in your phone and actually being a running Linux process at the moment. So if an app receives an intent message, or sorry, if an intent is sent to a particular recipient application, it's gonna be the reference monitor's job as part of it is to actually start this guy up if it's not running yet so that it can receive and process this message. So there's a fair bit of um, sort of um, uh, infrastructure that Android provides to applications for dealing with handling of these messages. And this is the sort of main thing that is, uh, that Java is required for in Android. So in Android's uh, sort of standard uh, expectation of how apps are written, uh, this whole process is gonna be written in Java. It's running on a Java virtual machine. And Android developers, sort of as part of the Android infrastructure, ship a library in Java whose job is to deal with interaction with the reference monitor and dispatching these intents. So this Java library is gonna be started for you, for your app, when the reference monitor decides you're getting a message, and this library implements careful details about handling these incoming messages for you. And then uh, Android has this notion of a component, which is basically a way to disambiguate where messages go within an application. So this application over here might have several components. Uh, basically, you can think of it as like addresses where you can send an intent message. These guys are just gonna be named by string. And they're all sort of logically sitting around in this Java process. Of course, some applications don't really wanna live in Java land. So they quickly get the intent out of the Java library and send it on somewhere else. Um, Android, as the paper points out, doesn't really restrict you to having to use Java, except that the standard bindings are written in Java. So it's entirely fine for an app to spawn like a different process, you know, app, you know, process two, and then they could sort of forward messages over here. These are running as the same user ID. They're basically indistinguishable in terms of security, uh, and uh, uh, Android lets you run arbitrary sort of Linux executables on this phone, different approximation. All right, does that make sense? All right, so in Android, uh, I'm not sure how relevant it is to this discussion about intents, but there are sort of several well-known component types. So for example, things that you see on your screen, 
are called activities in Android, so you can send an intent to an activity, and that sort of means that this app should pop up that sort of screen, that mode of app interaction. There's database components, uh, there's service, kind of RPC server components, uh, et cetera. Make sense? Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, you can run whatever you want on the side, but where Java comes in is that when the reference monitor starts your application to begin with, when the phone boots up, or when you first get your intent, it's gonna start a Java VM running some little shim code. And then if you want, you could take from that shim code and just say, well, immediately just like fork off and execute this regular Linux elf binary. Up to you. And the second thing that those Java bindings are sort of good for is that Android doesn't really try to specify or let you directly access this kernel API for dealing with intent messages. It's there, of course, you could try to do it, but it might not be stable across Android versions and devices, so the only thing they guarantee is if you wanna deal with intents, you should really use the Java library. So uh, for convenience and compatibility, if you wanna interact with intents, you can run whatever you want here, but then if you wanna send or receive an intent, you gotta jump back into a little Java thing that's gonna help you interact with the Java library. And there, the, uh, I think what they're saying in the paper is they'd be happy to let you have lower level access, but there's a fair bit of tricky stuff here and they'd rather not write it in five different languages, so they're just saying you should write it in Java. One reason why Java came along, like now it seems like a, maybe a bit of an anachronism, but um, one reason why Java came along is that when Android was being originally developed uh, like 15-ish years ago, it wasn't clear what the processors are gonna be on mobile phones. If it's gonna be ARM or MIPS or x86 or who knows what, like now RISC-V is around. Um, and for that reason, they wanted to get their apps to be portable to whatever the future device is gonna have in terms of hardware. So that's one benefit not security related, just functionality portability that they wanted most of the apps to be written in Java because then you could run it on a new CPU with fairly little effort required to convince all the developers to recompile their stuff and, and so on. So I think that's one sort of historical reason why it's there. And now it's basically just like, you know, shim. I should say, most apps still end up being written in Java. It's a fine language. It avoids many of the memory problems you guys have seen, et cetera. But uh, in terms of like the hard requirements, shim you must use. Make sense? Other questions about sort of the structure of these apps and intents being sent between them? Yeah, all right, so we'll talk about security, yeah, so that's gonna be indeed, yeah, the main story. Okay, so let's look at what these intents look like internally to understand uh, what the reference monitor has to deal with them. Um, so an intent, Roughly, you can think of it as having sort of three interesting fields. So one is you can actually name the component where you wanna send the intent. So in Android, all the apps have names. In Java style, you can sort of imagine it's like com.google. I don't know, dialer is maybe the dialing application on your phone and that's the name of your uh, application where you might wanna send an intent and then you sort of do slash you know, I don't know, some you know, component name. I don't remember the component names for the phone application off the top of my head, but uh, you could imagine the phone in, uh, the, the phone app on Android has some standard component name that you might know if you wanna make a phone call. So you, you're gonna send a message to that component in the phone app on your Android phone. So that's sort of the destination of the message, if you will. Uh, there's also an action field, which uh, you can uh, specify. So for example, there's a dial action. These are all strings, by the way, so like easy to understand what's going on. String dial, that's gonna cause the recipient to realize you wanna make a phone call, you wanna dial something. And uh, these guys are completely defined by the apps. So the app sort of defines this string and uh, every application picks an app name, every application gets to decide what its components are named. The Android framework basically defines sort of a whole lot of uh, 
different actions that are useful. And this is gonna actually be the place where it's gonna allow applications to interact with one another without knowing exactly what the other app is. So, so Android sort of figured out like all the different actions you might wanna do, view a document, make a phone call, look at a map, uh, all kinds of sort of strings that indicate different actions you might wanna do on a smartphone. They predefine a whole library of these things for you. And the fact that all the apps agree on these strings is what's gonna enable the apps to sort of interact reasonably well with one another because they know that that's what one app provides and that's what another app wants. And then there's a data field for each intent, and this is kind of a URI, a URL-like thing that uh, tells you what you wanna do with this uh, intent, some, some payload. So for example, if you wanna make a phone call, you could have, I don't know, 617253 something something. That could be the phone number that you wanna uh, call. And this is how you make a phone call in Android to a given number, you send an intent to the dialer application with a well-known action, and here's who you wanna call. Make sense? So one cool thing in Android that I wanna mention is that the, surprisingly, the component is actually optional. The recipient is optional. And that's actually sort of the crux of why this thing works well for mashing up many applications. So um, if the component name is not supplied, Android calls this an implicit intent. And it's gonna be the job of the reference monitor to figure out where could I send this thing. So the reference monitor is gonna look at the other fields like the action and the data, and then it's gonna ask, uh, look, look through its table of installed applications and figure out where should dial actions go for a phone number. And uh, if there's a single answer, it'll just send the intent there. And if there's multiple answers, this is actually when you'll get a pop-up box in your phone saying which application do you want to handle this particular operation. So for instance, if you have an action that's a view document action and a data that's a URL of a particular type, like a PDF, and you might have multiple PDF viewers installed, the reference monitor knows about all the apps you have installed. It knows that they handle different kinds of actions and data types. And if there's multiple PDF viewers that have a document view action handler for PDF data, it'll ask you, and then when you say that's where, that's the app, then it'll remember that for this pattern of action and data types, that's the component it should fill into the intent, and that's where the message should go. So this is the sort of plan for uh, allowing apps that don't really know about one another to nonetheless interoperate in some form. You got a question? That's right, yeah, so I think the, like in, in broad strokes, I think iOS and Android are pretty similar. Many things can happen in bo both worlds. They are similar to the low level hardware story that we talked about Monday. They're in some sense similar in this story as well. I think one difference is the extent to which there's configurability and flexibility in these two worlds. So in iOS, there's of course some notion of a sort of an implicit intent kind of thing where you wanna send an object and have some app open it. But Android, I think qualitatively sort of takes it to a different level and they really have many more things that are configurable. So you can change your home screen, like going to the home screen is an intent. Going to like opening the phone dialer is an intent. The web browser is an intent. And these are not things that are intents in Apple's world. Like you can choose a map application. You could like install Google Maps or Waze or Apple Map or whatever you want on Android. There's like a standard set of actions for opening a map. And uh, I've never used an iPhone seriously, so uh, I'm sort of, you know, this is a theoretical view of an iPhone for me. Uh, but uh, my understanding is an iPhone, there's like not as many configuration points. I don't think you get to install, you know, Waze or replace the home screen in, a, in iOS world. Uh, you, you don't get to like install a new settings application that configures your phone settings. Whereas like all the settings management is indeed through intents on Android as well. So it's like quite configurable. Um, to some extent I think this is coming from maybe Google's desire to have Android be applicable in a wider range of settings. So I think iOS is really opinionated. This is gonna be your smartphone. 
and you want to use Apple apps, and uh, that's fine. It's like you know a, a certain class of applications are well uh, covered by that design. I think Android, through flexibility, is sort of aiming at other applications, where maybe it's not a phone, maybe it's a refrigerator, or maybe it's a vending machine, or maybe it's some other device, and there the vendor that's manufacturing, I don't know, a vending machine, might want to replace the home screen. It's not going to be the home screen is launching apps. It's like picking what you want to buy from a vending machine. So that flexibility lets uh, device manufacturers do more stuff on top of Android. So it's a little bit, in some ways, hard to compare because they, they have different sort of goals and use cases that they want to support. Um, but yeah, does it make sense? Yeah, question? Um, the difficulty basically stems down, t stems from the fact that the kernel is trying hard to prevent you from doing anything but send intents. So uh, this is basically part of our isolation story. We assume the kernel is correct, so it's configured by the Android framework to give each app a separate UID and access to its own files, but not access to kernel controlled data structures and not access to other apps directly. So as long as we get that set up right and there's no bugs in the kernel, both you know could be wrong but mostly right, then you just can't uh, break a kernel. Like there's one syscall to send an intent, it only goes to the reference monitor. You don't get to choose, like I want to send an intent there. It's like not a syscall you can make. Yeah, that's sort of the plan. Other questions? All right. So. So that's what these intents are and uh, what enables these guys to be uh, reasonably flexible. So let's now talk about permissions and where the security decisions are being made in Android here. Um, so intent permissions. So in Android's world, um, the, I think this is maybe not as well described in the particular paper that you guys read. Um, Permissions are controlled through the use of what's, what Android calls a label. The label is really just a, a string that is going to be used to define some privileges that an app might have and some sort of rights or some, some protection that a component might require uh, in terms of controlling who can talk to it. So maybe let's, let me describe a concrete example instead of trying to define it in general case. So for example, one of these labeled strings could be the string dial perm. So this is defined by the Android framework and represents the label of applications that might want to make phone calls and also of components whose job is to make phone calls on behalf and they're going to require this permission. So here's how this is going to look. So every application, like a sender of an intent in our case, so it's an application, and for every application, we're gonna have a list of privileges that those applications have. So privileges are sort of positive things, you can do more with a privilege, and a privilege list uh, here for an application is a list of these labels. So an application might have the dial perm privilege, and uh, I don't know, might also have the camera privilege and, and so on. And the reference monitor knows all these list of privileges that your app might have. And then on the flip side, you're gonna have the recipient application. And here, these components come in in a little bit more detail. So you're gonna have some component like, I guess, in my example, I was imagine. Uh, I guess I didn't give it a name, but uh, maybe there's some kind of a dial component inside the phone application that's going to be responsible for receiving intents to make a phone call. So if you want to protect who can make phone calls, uh, we're going to associate a, one of these labels with this component. So this is going to be a restriction, basically uh, restrict to dial perm. And what this means is that for every component in an Android application, the developer of that component is gonna choose what permission label protects that component. And what that means is it's a permission label that the callers might, must have in their list of privileges. So if you have an application that has the dial perm privilege, it's now gonna be allowed 
to send an intent to this dial component inside the phone app. And some other application that doesn't have that privilege will not be able to send uh, any intents to this dial component. Maybe other components in the phone app are okay, but not this one. This one's protected by dial firm, and you must have the dial firm privilege in order to send a message. So that's how Android sort of the, the knob that the Android framework provides in order to allow application developers to control intents being sent. Make sense? Questions about how this works? And yeah? Yeah, good question. So let's talk about where they come from. Um, so there's a couple of questions we could try to answer. One is where this list of strings comes from. Like, what, what's the set of privileges total? Are there, like, is it dial firm and take a picture and that's it, or are there more? And uh, one cool thing about Android is that actually even the privileges themselves are defined by applications. So actually, the whole story here is very much application control. So Android wants to allow application developers to have quite a bit of flexibility into sort of replacing any system component almost that they might want. So all these components could be replaced and redefined by applications themselves. A number of standard permissions come with Android sort of built-in applications, like the built-in phone dialer defines dial perm for us, and the camera app defines a camera permission label, and so on. So there's a whole list of these guys that probably come on your phone already because you already have a bunch of baseline default apps. But all these things are gonna sort of at a mechanism level, they're gonna be defined by individual applications. So one way to sort of think of it is that um, all this permission information are gonna actually uh, come from the application manifest. So the manifest was this thing that we briefly described over here. It was sort of the other part of the application that was on the side uh, next to the actual code and data that was gonna run the application on your phone. And for the most part, the most exciting part of this manifest is indeed uh, probably related to all these permissions. So there's roughly three things that the manifest says about permissions. One is that the manifest can actually define a new type of a permission, a new label. So you can define a new label. And the reason an app might define a new label is because an app is going to be providing some resource or something like being able to make a phone call. The phone app provides that. But at the same time, it wants to allow the user to control who's gonna make phone calls. So the phone app is gonna define a new label saying these are the apps that are gonna make phone calls. It doesn't have an opinion about who's gonna make phone calls. The user is gonna decide that. But the app defines a label to help the user and other apps agree on this whole plan. So the app can define new labels that are gonna get used to sort of stick this label in, in places. Um, the app also requests privileges. And this is basically a list of labels, very much like on that diagram on the left there. Each app is gonna, in the manifest, say, here's the privileges that I think my app needs in order to run. And the user is gonna have to make a, some decision here about whether that's okay or not. Um, so in some ways, this is where this whole user consent comes in uh, that the paper makes a big deal about. Uh, so when a user installs an application, at least in sort of originally, we'll talk about some details later, but uh, originally when you install an application on Android, your phone is gonna look at the manifest of that application and tell you that, look, this app is asking for this set of labels, these privileges. This app you're installing might want to take pictures with a camera, might need dial perm, might need other privileges. And then it's the user's choice or decision to approve that or not, to install the app or, or not install it. Make sense? Question. Uh, so what do you mean request privileges to another app? Like, like if you install a new app that wanted to access your messenger app, and then it can then it access all the things that messenger app has. So, so it's not transitive if you mean if that's what you're getting at. So I might request access. So let's let's imagine I have a phone app on my smartphone. Seems reasonable, and then I install an app that wants to make phone calls. 
well, that app is gonna request a dial perm privilege. What that means is that the app can now send messages to the phone app and cause it to make a phone call. Internally, the phone app has all kinds of privileges, like being able to poke at the raw GSM chipset, maybe, or interact with my phone book and all this stuff. But that doesn't translate now into a privilege that this new app I installed has, if, if that makes sense. The new app that I installed just has the privilege to send an intent to the phone app. And then internally, the phone app is gonna exercise its privileges at once, but it's not gonna, they're not gonna get sort of given or stolen to this app that is able to send us a message. It's just the sending of an intent. That's all these privileges are gonna allow. Not any sort of direct access into the target application. Is that what you were asking about, sort of, or? That's, so, so yeah, you cannot um, have an app that directly accesses any state from a second application. It must be all through messages. So like we were talking about in this picture, each app has its own files in the file system. And it may be that this guy is allowed to send a message to this guy over here and ask it, like, can you please read this data? It will never be allowed to directly go and read these files. It, it has to send a message, this guy will helpfully read it and send back the response maybe through another intent, but has to be through messages, absolutely. Uh, this is indeed an important point about this whole design. Must be all through messages, because then it gives the reference monitor a chance to actually mediate all of this, and you sort of understand what, what might or might not happen. Sense? Other questions? All right, so, so, the manifest is gonna specify what privileges an app needs in order to run. And then the last thing that the manifest is gonna specify is for each component, what is the sort of protection label for that component? So by default, if you have a component in your application and you don't say anything in the manifest, it is private. No amount of permissions on the sender side is gonna allow them to send you a message. Seems like a safe default. And then if you want to allow applic other applications to send your component a message, you stick it in your manifest saying this component with that name is gonna be protected by a particular label. It's like my phone app is gonna say my the dial component is protected by the dial perm label. And now this achieves the sort of configuration we've been talking about where now other apps with dial perm privileges can make a phone call by sending me a message. So it's all sort of coming in the manifest. Question back there, yeah. Are there other apps that then need to keep components that So they have to be aware of some things, maybe not the literal name and component name of this phone app itself. The thing they have to be able to do is send some kind of an intent here that will cause the reference monitor to route it to the right place. So probably this means that they either have to sort of agree on this action string, like the notion of making a phone call is gonna be baked in, or like Android developers supply, like please use this string if you're talking about making a phone call. And then all the apps will just use this and then that'll work out nicely. If everyone makes up their own string, like dial or dialing or please call or whatever, yeah, it's not gonna work. So that's why it's actually important to that Android formulates like a long list of standard actions and by the fact that your sort of applications are developed looking at these actions and they agree on how to, how to name the making of a phone call, that helps a lot because the reference monitor knows, ah, you wanna make a phone call, sounds good. Uh, and then the app that is initiating this message has no idea which phone you, app you have installed. You might have installed Skype or you might have installed Google Hangouts, whatever, they can all handle this and they can pick up the phone call and uh, route it. And then the only maybe other exception is that um, they need to request some privileges to do so, perhaps. So that's the other thing, like these uh, privilege, it's not quite enough to know the right string, you have to stick the right privilege in your manifest. You have to say, well, you know, I'm gonna be making phone calls, let me ask for that privilege. If you never ask for it, you will not be able to send this message, or you can send it, the reference monitor will reject it. Um, so you have to, have to agree on this string, and uh, the string you stick in your privilege list in the manifest to ask for it. So for both these cases, like the, the reason this works out okay in practice is that the Android guys have a long list of like standard action strings and standard you know, permission labels that uh, 
help apps agree. Question. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can totally, like, uh, one, you know, I'm going to make up some example that might not be actually true, but for example, if you have a Facebook app, and the Facebook app might want to allow other apps to add a friend, what the heck, uh, they can totally define a string, like com.facebook.add a friend. That's like a new action now. And if your other app knows about this, they can send an intent to com.facebook.add a friend, and the payload is like, I don't know what they want to do, like the name of the friend, or who knows, or by phone number, they can totally do this, indeed. Uh, and the only benefit of having it be defined in the standard Android sort of SDK framework is that when you go to the documentation, you will find that string and you'll use it. You'll not make up a second one, and then you agree. Make sense? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, the one super impressive thing is like how configurable all this stuff is. You can totally, you don't have to use any standard component from Android, you know, the, the, the source code that Google puts out at all. You could replace everything down to the phone, the launcher, everything. Yeah. You had a question? So this is a yeah, cool thing, which is that indeed you can, tr any app can cook up a manifest saying, I'd like the privilege to look at your camera, get your location, I don't know, make phone calls, read your SMS messages. You can request all this stuff. And uh, you can sort of think of it as being good and bad. Like, you know, the user now is in a position to, well, have the power. They can do this if they really want, but also you have to worry that maybe the user will make the wrong choice. So there's a, you know, I think this is one thing where, We've, there's no clear answer yet. Like uh, iOS is certainly on one side where you can't even request some of these things. Android is quite a bit on the flexibility side. It's not clear what the right trade-off is. You can see that some things just like are very hard to do or cumbersome on iOS. On the other side, maybe there's some security downsides here. Um, one thing I should mention is that the original plan for Android was that it was gonna tell the user what the list of privileges was at install time, then you say yes and move on with your life, that's it. So that turned out to be like not as good of a plan, the paper sort of you know, talks about this a bit, and they say that the new plan is, well, you still put these in your manifest, but then when the app actually tries to exercise a privilege, when it like first sends an intent that needs that privilege, the reference monitor will pop up a dialog box on your phone saying, well, this app really wants to use your camera or your location, is that okay? And then you can say no, and then it will not have that privilege. So they've been experimenting and trying to sort of fine tune the right way to get the user's consent in their terminology to, to do this. But uh, in terms of what's possible at the mechanism level, yeah, any app can ask for any other privilege. There's like one exception we'll get to in a second, but like it's not super exciting, yeah. Make sense? Other questions? Yeah, so I think uh, that's a different kind of an attack, indeed, where I, like, I install, I don't know, like a clock app, and it so happens that in the manifest, one thing we haven't actually talked about, the other part of the manifest that slightly relevant is in the manifest, you get to define what intents you want to handle as implicit intents. So you could say, well, like you know, my alarm clock app turns out to be a little bit malicious. It says, I'll handle anything, what the heck? You can say that. And then for every single app, sending any intent, you'll now get a message saying, you know, you thought you were gonna configure your wireless settings. Do you wanna use your alarm clock to do that? Uh, so, uh, if, okay, so you'll get this error message if there are multiple handlers now, like, you know, you have the regular, you know, network handler configuration and this alarm clock also is handling it. You'll probably say no. The more dangerous thing is probably what you're getting at, which is that I'm trying to open a file that I had no app for. Like, I'm trying to open, I don't know, a CAD document for like some 3D drawing on my phone I had no app for it before, but now the alarm clock says, great, I'll handle them all. Then the reference monitor is gonna helpfully say, well, only one app, I'm not gonna bother the user, I'll just send it there. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a, like a bit of a, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any sort of clear answer as to whether this is good or bad that we can you know, deduce from first principles. I think the story that Android has for handling this is that they allow phones to opt into a more iOS-like, for lack of a better term, mode where a phone can say, I will only install apps that Google's Play Store blessed. So this is the iOS model where Apple developers carefully look at all the apps being submitted and you know, they probably catch that kind of stuff, like your app is trying to handle too many things, it's just like not a thing alarm clock apps do. Uh, 
Google has the same plan, right? Although they have servers that actually will like execute, so like whenever you submit an app to Google's Play Store, they will actually run your app on some virtual machine. And they will like randomly try to interact with it, see what it does, all kinds of analysis happens. You can actually do cool things. You can actually like submit an app that does something and phones home, and you can submit it, you see it run in Google's data center, and you can sort of see what they're doing with it, uh, because just an app running in some virtual machine, if you have access to the network. Anyway, um, and then they'll probably find this. So for sort of smartphones that have that level of protection enabled, you'll probably have Google catch a large number of these things. Um, so this is like one thing I'll, I'll come back to later, though, is that um, this plan of thinking of security in terms of the privileges needed to send a message to a component sort of has this mindset that the victim here is the component, if you will. Like, that's the component that really has to be guarded, and the intent is sort of the potentially malicious thing. Like, you know, who's, we, we gotta fence off the component from all these intents coming in. This might not be the case. If you're trying to open a document, that's really like the document, that's the thing that's gotta be fenced in. It's actually the component that's kind of questionable. So the mindset of trying to protect components here is really much more about the integrity of components than the secrecy of the messages being sent around. And there are some extensions actually in their model that try to get at this and might help you deal with these kinds of problems, although they're not, I think, as crisp as this plan so far. Other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry? sorry? Why? Um, you mean like the actual Google Play Store app on your Android device, why it requests those privileges for itself? Um, one guess might be for uh, sound to keyboard input, uh, because like on any keyboard you can click that, although maybe that works differently. I don't know, I, you know, I, I don't wanna speculate too much in this point, yeah. Um, so at some level, maybe this is a good example of where time of use confirmation is a better plan than approving these permissions up front, where maybe the user has a chance to say no meaningfully. So the, the one problem with the previous scheme was that I just want to use the app. So like it asks for a whole bunch of privileges. I don't know, is it going to use them or not? I want to use the app. I'll install it and sort of hope for the best. Whereas I think if you have time of use ability to say no, you can sort of start running the app and see if it actually needs those privileges at any particular instant. And then if it seems to be requesting stuff that doesn't need, isn't relevant or you don't understand why it needs it, you could say no. Maybe the app will crash at that point, but at least you said no. And uh, You got a question or no? Sounds good. Okay. Questions? Do you know if at the time you enable, it might just be a detailed question, but is there any restriction on what that can do? You could maybe define a duplicate or something. Yeah, so there's actually kind of a funny thing in Android. Yeah, there's a... Mm, my sort of personal sense, they, I don't think they really thought out this new label plan as well. So this label namespace, so what it means to define a new label is that you get to pick a new string kind of like dial perm, and what you get to specify for that string, like if it's just a string, like strings exist, you don't need to define them. What you really define is what that means, and you basically plop down some description of what this label is, and a type for this label, we'll talk about the types in a second, and then this description, it's like a text saying, well, this permission will allow the app to make a phone call on your phone. And that, that's actually what pops up when you try to install an app. So it's, you're gonna, you, you never see the string dial from on your screen. What you see is the description that some app specified when defining this label. So they have a bit of a problem in some sense where I think a registration of these labels is first come, first served. So it better be the case that all the important stuff are registered first when your phone installs the base apps and then subsequent apps can't redefine it. If it already exists, you can't redefine it. But that's kind of problematic. Like if Facebook wants to define a permission for adding a friend or looking at, I don't know, how many friends you have, it's not listing your friends. Well, now they're in a little bit of a pickle because if you install the Facebook app second after some malicious app, then the first malicious app could define the list the Facebook friends permission with like say, oh, it's like it's a type normal that doesn't actually matter very much and the description is does nothing. Uh, it's like a little bit of a, yeah, oversight if you will, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So you're asking the right questions, maybe she should have done something else, yeah. <laughs> in the design, yeah. Other questions? 
OK, so let's talk about uh, a little bit about these uh, different types of permissions. Uh, so in Android, there's uh, um, three types of permissions that they talk about. So they have normal permissions that uh, they say, well, these are not super important. These are things like change the wallpaper on your phone or change the ringtone, things that they basically don't actually even prompt the user for. Then there's dangerous permissions. And these are things that uh, you actually need explicit consent or prompt from the user. So the user must say yes. And then there's signature permissions. And these guys are um, sort of a special case where uh, basically only apps from the same developer are allowed to ask for a signature permission. So let's go through these guys in order and talk about why it's actually useful. So why do they even have the normal permissions? So why do they need a permission to change your ringtone or wallpaper when they're not even going to ask the user if it's okay? What's the point? Yeah? So if you have do not disturb on and you don't want no one to hear your ringtone? Yeah, so I think what's going on is kind of, you know, a defense in depth, if you will, or like avoiding annoyances and being able to audit what happened. So it's not the end of the world. It's like not worth asking the user up front, do you want to allow this app to, I don't know, change your volume, you know, change your background, et cetera. But it's useful so that an app developer that didn't think its app was going to change the background can prevent it from changing the background if something goes wrong. That's kind of like a difference between the app developer is one thing and the app's code is a different thing. The app developer might be pretty well-meaning and says, I don't actually want any of these permissions. And the app code might get compromised later. And you want to prevent that app code from getting too many privileges, even though you know, if the developer asks for them, we'll be OK. I think one, one difference, and also good to be able to audit, like some, something happens to your background, you can just list which apps have access to change your background, and it must have been one of those. So kind of a helpful measure, but maybe not as strong of a measure as we're usually used to talking about in the context of security. Make sense? So dangerous permissions, that's sort of the standard stuff you, you might have been thinking about all along, like dial perm is a dangerous permission, re sending SMS messages is a dangerous permission, and these things prompt the user either at install time or at the time the intent is getting sent, and the reference monitor wants to know if this is okay, and the user will have to say yes. Hopefully it makes sense, no questions about that. All right, and these signature permissions, they're kind of a special thing where roughly um, what what the mechanism is, is that um, if you recall from way earlier, Android apps are signed by the key of some developer. So a signature permission is a permission where only the same developer's applications are able to ask for that permission. So the way to think of it is that as a developer, maybe I have multiple apps. Like I got, if I were Facebook, I'd have the Facebook app, the Facebook Messenger app, the Facebook, I don't know, photo uploader app. Maybe I want them as separate apps so that they are separated from one another for development purposes, for, I don't know, allow users to pick and choose. But I want them to share stuff, like my Facebook Messenger app should be able to look at my list of Facebook friends from the Facebook app. They should be able to share this. But I don't want any random app on the user's phone to be able to come along and say, I want the Facebook friends list, because the user might then give it away accidentally. So a signature permission is basically a statement by the developer that this is a label that other apps from the same developer might use and the apps will communicate internally between each other safely, but this is not a thing that the user should be allowed to give away. So this is sort of the, uh, you know, so some way to help the developers partition their apps without necessarily exposing an attack surface by doing so. Question back there. Uh, what entity is responsible for prompting the user for consent? Reference monitor. And like, of course, some library on top of it, whatever. But like, that, that's the guy that causes that dialog box to show up. Sometimes it prompts them on installation, and so the reference monitor also is in charge of handling installing apps. Yeah. So indeed. So uh, the Google Play Store, when you download an app, the Google Play app is responsible for doing like an HTTP GET download that APK file, and then it sends an intent to the reference monitor directly, saying install this. And then the reference monitor basically like doesn't just pass along intents. It has its own sort of management interface, if you will, like a component inside the reference monitor that's responsible for managing this whole thing, simplifying a little bit, but roughly you, you send an intent to the reference monitor saying, go install, and the reference monitor will prompt the user saying, hi, you're about to install this thing. Is that a good or not? 
And there are some simplifications to this workflow so the user doesn't have too many things flashing and whatever, but that's roughly the plan. Other questions? All right, so here's an interesting question. Why, why are the apps signed? Is this the sort of main reason? It seems like a corner case, if you will, for getting apps to be signed. What's the point of these signatures? Like if I don't have a signature permission that I care about, should I not sign my app? Do you use signatures for anything else? Yeah. Sort of, I think you're close to it, but actually, the first time I installed the app, I don't actually know who was supposed to write it. I don't know what your public key should have been. So in Apple's world, the app gets signed by roughly Apple, saying, you know, I, we checked it, so, you know, someone is good, install it. So you, you know whose key to expect. When you're installing an app for the first time on an Android phone, you don't know who it should be signed by. So the first time you install it, they actually, they actually make a point in this paper saying, they don't really have a plan for first time installs unless you opt into this sort of Google Play monitoring of your app installs. Yeah? Yeah, so I think that's basically the, the, the other thing for, for signatures is that really two reasons. One is the signature permissions, which are corner case, but like updates, that's the, the crucial thing. And the plan there is the first time you install the app, you trust that somehow the public key was okay you are not gonna have any plan for deciding if that's the right public key or not. But all the updates from that point on must come from the same, uh, be signed by the same public key as the initial install. Uh, so it's kind of like SSH, when you SSH into a server for the first time, you're gonna sort of mostly trust that the public key is okay, but then all the subsequent connections, you'll check that it must be the same thing. Okay, question. So what are possible ways to those sort of side, side loading attacks? Um, so I think the, what, what sort of happens in practice is that either you opt in to only installing apps from Google's App Store, or you are careful about which website you download the app from. So like you go to a website, like you know, so some trusted app.com, better be HTTPS, so that it's, you know that it's not intercepted over the network. We'll talk about that in a couple of lectures. But uh, roughly, you have to have your own out-of-band plan for trusting that you got the right APK file for the first install. So uh, good for flexibility, great for like being able to develop and prototype stuff and having freedom, but uh, like, you know, the user could potentially make the wrong choice, which is why, like initially, they didn't really have this Google Play Store plan at all, and they sort of had to fill it in almost for like managing a whole bunch of default decisions for average users that need some hand-holding, if you will. Question back there. The checking of the signature when you stage, is that done by Google Play or from the operating system? Because from the operating system in the sense like, well, the reference monitor kind of, or some, some system component that's roughly next to the reference monitor. So Google Play gets to supply an APK file to your phone, and it might sign it in addition to the regular developer. So maybe then your app will say, oh, that's great, it's signed by Google Play, I wanted that. Uh, but once you give an APK file to your phone, the phone will do its own checking, that the update must be coming from the same key as was initially installed. That point doesn't really matter where it came from Google Play or not initially. Yeah. yeah. Do you cover those? Sorry? So dependencies, I think uh, Android's world like doesn't really have any, like they're not trying to support applications that have complicated dependency structures. Like, oh, you know, uh, I'm gonna run my app and I need these other three apps installed because I depend on them. Uh, you could write apps like this that want to send intent somewhere, but nothing in the Android framework will install dependencies for you. You can ask the user, hey, you know, if you don't install these three other things, I'm not gonna be able to run my, this app, but uh, there's no dependency management in the framework itself. Yeah. All right, so, so we've seen these different permission types. Um, the style of, like one thing I wanna contrast, like point out about Android's plan is the style in which 
these security policies are imposed on top of existing application code or on top of just like application code that is not enforcing those policies on its own. So this is what's often called uh, mandatory access control. Often abbreviated MAC. And what this refers to, what the mandatory refers to is that you sort of have a split between the code of the application, like the code inside of this app box there or this component box here, and then the policy being enforced on that app. So the reference monitor in the Android world is making sure that only intents that match these manifests can get through. So even if the code is buggy, the reference monitor will potentially protect it from certain kinds of problems. And one cool thing about this is that you can actually you know, maybe analyze what's going on on your phone. So you can say, well, you know, there's uh, my phone, my dialer is exposed to these three apps. Here's all the apps that are you know, viewing PDF files. Here's who's able to look at my contacts, et cetera. So it's kind of nice to factor out policy from the code for analysis purposes. Um, it's good for, to some extent, for dealing with buggy code. So if you have, if you were to have applications whose job was in every component to check who is calling them, I'm sure you'll have applications that sometimes forget to do this in some code path. And uh, having a mandatory access control scheme is good against those kinds of mistakes or oversights uh, to help the developer make sure that the policy is enforced even if the app is a little bit buggy. And another sort of nice thing, typically in a, this kind of a Mac world where the policy is forced down upon you, is that you might actually be able to have uh, default policies that are actually pretty secure. So for example, maybe the default policy should be no component can talk to anything else. Whereas if you're just straight up writing application code, it might be natural to just write application code that accepts messages by default and then later think about when to block things. So that's sort of the situations where this mandatory access control sorts of policies come in well. Um, I should contrast this with um, the usual thing you might have seen in sort of Unix-like operating system, usually called discretionary access control or DAC. And the differences are in terms of who is enforcing policies and who is setting them. In the mandatory control case, there are some manifest that specifies what the policy is and a reference monitor is gonna force the policy on you, on your code. And in the DAC case, basically, there's just a bunch of permissions on files, if you will, um, on files, and apps can set permissions. So these benefits that we were talking about here are kind of gone, right? Like if the app code is buggy, it'll forget to set permissions. If the app code is buggy, it might change the permission to something later that you didn't want. It's really hard to analyze. You don't know what the hell the policy is at any given time and it keeps changing because permissions keep changing, files appear, disappear. Uh, and it's gonna be hard to enforce some kind of a secure default uh, because you install an app, it creates world writable files all of a sudden. So. This is sort of the, the contrast here and sort of reflects the fact that um, Android, I think, really wants to help app developers do the right thing by default. Of course, you can probably, in Android's case, circumvent some of these things if you really have code that wants to be buggy, but uh, I think this is part of their plan to make sure the defaults are good. Make sense? Other questions about this stuff? All right, so this is the sort of one view of this world in terms of this mandatory access control. I wanna now talk about a couple of exceptions. So like th this so far seems like a very you know, straightforward plan. You have a reference monitor, check stuff, the manifest declare everything, that's the policy, the code doesn't matter. Turns out the world is more complicated or apps that people really wanna run are more complicated. And there's a few sort of interesting exceptions where the Android permission model doesn't quite look like this mandatory world with a single policy in one place. So one complication has to do with RPC between services. And the setup is roughly, you have this application and you have some kind of an RPC component. And the RPC component is gonna accept messages from other apps. And in Android's manifest view, you get to set one label for protecting this RPC component for all RPCs going to it. So it's somewhat coarse grained. Um, so if you have multiple other applications that wanna send RPCs to this one service, 
well, of course, they all better have this privilege and this label, but otherwise, they're not really distinguishable. And often, what you end up wanting is really finer-grained control than whole component protection. So it's all well and good that all these guys are allowed to talk to RPC service, but maybe you want to distinguish between these callers and do different things depending on who is calling. So in Android, uh, this is one of the exceptions where they basically say, well, you can actually look at the caller. So RPC component is going to check the caller. So it knows this is A1 calling versus A2 calling. And the RPC server is going to say, well, A2 is calling. That's all well and good you had the label, but I'm going to deny the RPC anyway because that's not what the plan is, let's say. Uh, and this uh, sort of violates the SMAC plan because by just looking at the manifests, you might conclude that, well, it's like wide open. Anyone can send an RPC, but instead there's like a more complicated plan internally. So like, uh, these guys are not super dogmatic about the SMAC plan. That's like a reasonable trade-off. Um, actually, in lab two, you guys are also going to do the same thing where um, at least in the first parts you guys have been doing so far, you're setting firewall rules between these containers that look a lot like these manifest policies that say who you can talk to whom. But then in the last part four of the lab, you're going to have to actually do a thing like this where many people, many other containers can talk to the bank RPC server, and some of them are special, like the profile server, if you'll get to that at the end. That guy's special, and it's not really a matter of firewall rules. It's just that he can do different operations on the RPC server than some other containers. So it's like a fairly standard trade-off that Mac policies work well at a fairly coarse-grained scale, but then you really need cooperation from the actual code to decide on finer grain uh, policy decisions. Make sense? Questions about that? So here's another interesting uh, situation where Android doesn't really follow this Mac model completely, and it's uh, the notion of these broadcast intents that Android has. Uh, we talked a little briefly about this when you brought up the example of an app handling too many intents. And this is a problem in situations where the intent itself is the thing to protect. The payload of the intent is the sensitive thing, not the component that's receiving it. So maybe the simplest example of this is that on Android, when your phone gets a text message, an SMS message, it actually sends an SMS received intent. And this intent has the payload containing the actual text message that you got. And this guy is sent to all the apps that subscribe to this intent. So here, it's a situation where, you know, of course, you have some app and some component, uh, and uh, maybe you have a label on the component, but it's not so interesting whether the app, wh whether it's allowed to, wh whether it's okay for this SMS uh, intent to be sent to this component or not, or like whether the component should be protected. What's really a question is like, who should be able to receive these guys, even if they allow it to be sent into that component? Sorry, maybe I'm saying too many words here, but hopefully the example is clear. We want to protect the contents of the intent rather than protecting the component that's receiving the intent. Make sense? So in Android, uh, what they came up with is basically a way to annotate the intent itself with a label, same kind of a label as there. So when you're sending an intent, you can call a function uh, broadcast, and you can send your intent here, which is the SMS received, and then you get to specify a label. And this optional label might be something like in Android, there's a permission called receive SMS. It's the same kind of permission that we were talking about there, but here it's being used in a different way. Instead of being a thing on a component that protects the component, it's actually attached to the intent itself, and the rules are not different. The rule is this intent will only be sent to apps that have this privilege. So to complete this picture, we have to take a look at the component, actually have to figure out what app does this component sit inside of. And the app itself has our privilege list. And it better be the case that this receive SMS be here, receive SMS. If this label is in the privilege list of the application, then it's okay for this component to receive that intent. Slightly roundabout. I think it 
gets at the goal, which is that the app might, must be kind of privileged to get this intent, uh, but it's kind of a slightly clunky or like doesn't look exactly like our other plans there. Then, question. Is it possible for an app to say that I'm fine with anyone, but this other app is receiving this intent? No, I think yeah, the, the doesn't support spite in a sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can use the RPC like mechanism to do it yourself in your code. Um, so this ability to check the color, I sort of drew it as here as a part of RPC. But really, like for any intent, you get to know who sent you the message. So you can for any incoming intent, you could see who sent it when they sent it, et cetera, what the payload is, and then decide whatever you want. Uh, but in the base uh, manifest, you can only do sort of these, uh, you know, label inclusion checks. Uh, yeah. One reason is that, as the paper talks about, they're, they're really quite user focused. They really wanna allow the user to make choices about which apps talk to each other ones. So having apps hard code knowledge of different apps means that if a new app comes along, you don't really know, should that guy be in the in list or the out list, uh, what? Uh, it's like makes for a much more rigid and sort of pre-configured world of apps then, if that makes sense. Question? There are certain situations where, for example, if you're making your profile go up to the extent of the potential text message and you know, the uh, answers of the answers are coming in. Yeah. Sometimes the, the prompt stays with the message for itself. Yeah, that's, that's how it works, works. yeah. So, so some apps that you install ask for this permission, for this privilege, and they listen for all the incoming SMS messages on your phone. Like, you know, well, I think the Lyft app did this, if I remember correctly. It's like when you try to sign into Lyft, Lyft sends you a text message, but the Lyft app listens for this intent. And when it sees your SMS, it doesn't need to copy paste this code from your SMS app into Lyft. It'll just get the intent right away and just process it. Now this means that you gave it access to read all your SMS messages at all times, but uh, yeah, that's uh, sort of life. Uh, I think uh, you know if SMS messages were more structured, you could have SMS messages that have like a, a, a MIME type, a destination application ID, all this stuff, but they're not. Uh, yeah, so, so like if, if SMS messages were more like intense, then you could route them accordingly and demux safely, but that's not the world. <laughs> I don't know if that analogy made any sense. Oh yeah, receive SMS is a dangerous permission. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, or me, yeah. Yeah, okay, so maybe the one thing I wanna uh, end on is uh, another example of uh, sort of an ex addition to this policy that actually does look a lot like this mandatory access control plan, which is the, the enterprise policies that the uh, paper talks about. So one recent thing the uh, Android developers added to their framework was the ability to have multiple user profiles in your phone and that is actually a thing that fits pretty well under this mandatory access control uh, worldview, where the user gets to specify fairly coarse-grained policies, like I'm now running as a company user, now I'm running as a personal user. And the policy is roughly that these apps running in different enterprise contexts are just quite separated from one another. Um, so that turns out to work pretty well. And again, this pattern shows up that I think at a coarse granularity, mandatory access control works pretty well because it actually is sensible to make sort of broad policy decisions and impose them on existing apps. But at a fine granularity, as you're seeing sort of, you know, fine-grained RPCs or other, or other situations like that, harder to impose a policy onto an app from the outside. All right, any other questions about this Android app security plan? All right, so I guess the, the summary of this is uh, hopefully uh, not so much about Android in particular, but about how you might structure a fairly sophisticated plan for application level access control. So all of this requires a secure kernel and secure boot like we talked about last time, but also having app security requires a sophisticated plan for being able to interpose on app interactions and allow these app interactions to sort of mesh well when you install new apps and to incorporate user decisions as well. And uh, it's been pretty successful, like despite all the problems that we discussed that you know, might come out, I think in practice works pretty well and is actually able to reconcile quite a bit of flexibility with security for users. All right, so that's it for mobile phone security. We'll talk about bug finding on Monday. <laughs>
You guys done?